Hey, hey, I'm Shay Keister, and I'm your host for the Casual Cattle Conversations podcast, the beef producer's place to explore new management practices. Thanks for tuning in, and welcome to the community. Hey, folks, thanks for tuning in to another episode. It is Shay here. Today, we are visiting with Rob Gill and Tanner King, and we are going to talk about the identity feeder test, and we are going to be discussing how through DNA technology, we can determine which calves to feed and which calves not to feed. And we can do this pretty early on in the process. So I'm excited to visit with Tanner and Rob today. Now, I do want to let you know that if you are looking for a speaker for your next event, whether that's leading a workshop about how to um, podcast, share on social media, really find your voice, or if you're looking for a keynote, or if you want to talk about advocacy, I want to let you know that I am accepting speaking gigs at the moment and for the end of 2023 and into 2024. So if you are looking for a speaker for your next event, be sure to head to my website, casualcattleconversations.com and submit a request through the contact us page and I will get back to you. With that, let's start this conversation with Tanner and Rob. All right. Well, Rob, Tanner, it is great to have you on the show today. I know I've been able to visit with each of you individually and I enjoyed those conversations, but I'm pretty excited to talk about the identity feeder test today and share that information with the audience. So before we dive into details on that, Tanner, I want to start with you. Would you please introduce yourself and kind of briefly talk about what you're doing in the beef industry today? Yeah, so Tanner King with Neogen. Uh, I've worked with Neogen for going on two years now um, and started as their, their feedlot uh, expert, I guess would be the way to put it. Um, prior to Neogen, I'd, I'd worked in the feed yard industry uh, for my entire working career, my adult career. I um, actually started working in the feed yard when I was 15 years old and, and haven't stopped. Um, from Worked for some big corporate feeders and some small uh, smaller feeders and, and everything in between and feed quite a few cattle myself uh, as we go. Um, and so Neogen kind of hired me to head up and, and start the feedlot genomics product for them and, and see how we can use genomics in a feed yard. Well, that's pretty neat. Rob, would you please tell us about um, True Ranches and your background in the beef industry so that producers know what your role is? Sure. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. Um, Rob Gill, I'm superintendent for True Ranches. And uh, so I manage all aspects of the land and cattle business for, for the True family. And uh, I'm originally a, an Oregon boy and uh, ended up uh, in Colorado running a kind of a pasture to plate Wagyu uh, business. And then uh, the Trues uh, recruited me. I've been here about eight years now. And so uh, really enjoyed the move to to Wyoming. Uh, the the true ranches is uh, is a really I think for me has been a unique experience. There's uh, uh, they acquired their first ranch in 1957, and today we have uh, eight cow calf operations. Um, we manage some stalker uh, yearling operation as well. We have two farms, and we have a feed lot in Wheatland, Wyoming. And uh, we recently partnered with uh, a bunch of folks for a packing plant in Jerome, Idaho called True West Beef. And so I would consider us uh, vertically integrated at this point um, from start to finish. And uh, we're ranches is pretty well located uh, really on the eastern side of Wyoming from the central part to the northeast to the south. We have uh, properties in uh, Black Hills, South Dakota, as well as uh, creeping into Colorado, uh, south of Cheyenne. So kind of spread out all over the place, primarily Angus based. Um, we do have sizable black baldy herds uh, that we mainly uh, produce terminal calves from. But uh, I think that kind of gives you a general idea of, of where we're spread out. And, and uh, we don't have much interest outside of uh, Wyoming other than the, the packing plant now in, in Idaho. Well, thank you for that explanation. Now, before we dive into how you've used the feeder test, I'd like Tanner, can you give a little bit of a background and just talk about what is this test? You know, who is it designed for just so that everyone has a general idea before we move forward in the conversation? 
Yeah, so uh, identity feeder is a it's a test uh, designed to kind of separate cattle based on on carcass merit, right? We we know that carcass traits are the most heritable, so they're they're easily um, transmitted on to progeny from there. That being said, they're also the easiest to collect data on and the easiest to to model and build predictions from. Um, you think about how we collect data on things and. We can go to you know to a packer or one of our, our partners and we can collect thousands of head of data in one day to, to kind of build out these models and make them work and so uh it's a it's a carcass merit test for cattle separate them top to bottom um we provide those results in two indexes on a one through ten score and then uh since i've been involved with neogen and came on we've we've evolved it into um, some more actionable items and some more tools used to to bring out the value of that test. Um, pretty hard to decide what to do with just a number at you. Um, but when we can put some some results and some, some scenarios behind it, it becomes a lot more valuable at that point. Um, simple simple DNA sample starts the test. And, and from there, we, we, um, we provide those predictions and those outcomes um, for each animal. So those are designed for the cow-calf producer to run these tests and then share that information with potential feeders, or who is it kind of designed for? So uh, it's it's pretty flexible in what we can do with it. Uh, if you're a cow-calf producer retaining ownership, um, there's a good way to decide which cattle you uh, you feed and which cattle you don't, or vice versa, um, depending on how you want to market calves. There's, there's a lot of different ways to use it. It's a good way to validate the quality of your cats if you're not retaining ownership. Um, sometimes that information is not shared down the pipeline like it needs to be. And so it's a good way to validate the quality of your cats if you're a cow-calf guy. Um, stalkers, backgrounders, feeders, uh, it's a good way to validate quality of cats before you buy them if you get the opportunity. Um, and then from there, there's uh, there's information to manage uh, manage those cattle beforehand, right? Traditionally, we um, we take information after the cattle are, are um, harvested, and we use that to make future decisions. Well, by that time, it's too late to make any kind of changes to that group of cattle, group of animals, as far as management goes. Right, we're we're stuck on relying on the past to make future management decisions instead of relying on information at hand to make future decisions. Thank you for walking through that explanation. And I always enjoy technology that's helping us be more proactive. So that's great to hear. Now, Rob, would you talk about how you have used the feeder test on True Ranches? Yeah. Um, you know, I might say that I was introduced uh, to Identity Feeder a couple of years ago. And and when we discussed the possibility of being able to predict you know, days on feed and the economics of what that might mean, it it really, I don't know, a light bulb went off with me. Um, you know, typically we've been just sorting on weight and uh, they go into the lot, the pen, and to be able to really look at, you know, the, the genetic merits or the potential and carcass merit of that animal really kind of changed my thinking about all that. And, and uh, you know, like, you know, in a normal feed yard, I would say that, you know, a lot, you're going to underfeed 10 or 20% or whatever that number is to take a guess and you're going to overfeed the same. And so to really be able to break that down and make a decision early on in the process, I think had some real opportunities for us. So we, um, thanks to Tanner's help and Neogen, uh, we organized a, a pilot, I'll call it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a data guy, uh, kind of an engineer by training. And so I'm like, yeah, show me the numbers, you know? And, uh, so we, we took, uh, we took about 700, a little over 700 steers. Um, we pulled samples on them and then we had the, the, the identity profile ran, um, uh, and Tanner can talk a bit more maybe about the specifics, but we sorted these into three pins, um, you know, 25% roughly into a shorter days on feed, 25 longer days, and kind of that 50% average, if you can imagine that bell-shaped curve. And um, we took them uh, through the prediction model and then sent them off, got that data back. And I'll let Tanner talk a little bit about the results of that. But um, 
I was very impressed with it. And so we're looking at, you know, from an operational perspective on how we get that implemented uh, uh, company wide. Does that answer your question? <laughs> I think so. Tanner, do you want to talk about what results kind of came back off of that? Yeah. So, I mean, when, when we talk about genetic information, right, there's the only thing that affects, there's, there's a, Genetics plus environment affects phenotype or how those animals turn out, right? And so when we think about a, a feed yard on most uh, commercial animals, that's going to be the closest environment to um, the same for every animal as they're going to get, right? Um, even on on Rob's operation where they're running cattle across several places, even though it's a ranch and, and all under the same management, each ranch has a different environmental impact or effect on those cattle. And so when we get into a feed yard setting um, where the environment becomes the same for most animals with minor differences, right? East facing pin versus west facing pin or something like that. Um, it, it minimizes the effect that environment plays on those cattle's growth. And, and then it, Genetics takes place from there, right? Genetics has a bigger impact on on how those cattle perform in that same environment. And so what we ended up doing with Rob's, Rob's set of steers, like he said, was we sorted those cattle and then uh, we predicted how long to feed each of those groups to reach the desired outcomes. And so when it was all said and done, we took his, his grid set up and we tried to maximize the days for that set of, for that particular grid, right? We tried to make those cattle um, reach as much grid premiums without pushing into uh, grid discounts. So to maximize the revenue per animal uh, for those cattle. And uh, it was all said and done. I mean, we, we sorted out those cattle really well, um, including, uh, you know, that was over last winter. We had some big, some big winter storms in that area and that really affected cattle performance, but all said and done, um, you know, we were 90% prediction accuracy on on the weight alone um and and the rest of the traits followed suit too and so uh it just comes down to a maximization of animal revenue okay so tanner we talked about rob you marketing on the grid and how you've used this feeder test to help him there but can you dive more into what that can look like for other producers if they're selling on the grid and how this feeder test can help them be more profitable. Yeah, so so by knowing uh, a predicted outcome of these carcass traits or the carcass quality, um, depending on how, where, and when you sell cattle, we can we can help you guys or help anybody to, to decide whether those cattle should be sold on a live basis. Um, because they're high yield and high dressing type cattle, whether we should um, uh, sell, or sell them on a carcass basis uh, or grid basis and which grids we should target, right? If you have a, a grid more favorable to quality um, uh, versus some of the, like the, the heavy discounts or things along those lines, we can, we can help sort cattle to go to one way and, and the balance to fall into those other grids. And so it gives a lot of um, information early on in the feeding period to decide how to market those cattle and how long you should feed them to get to those points to market them. Well, awesome. Thank you for explaining that. So Rob, how old were these calves when you took that DNA sample? Yeah, good question. Um, it varies a little bit. Generally, we try to gather the sample at weaning. That's kind of an efficient time when they're going through the chute. You're gathering weight already. And so we're able to gather the TSU sample. We're putting a, an RFID tag in their ear. They've already had a visual from birth. So we're linking that ultra high frequency tag uh, with uh, the TSU sample and then with the visual. And so generally, I would say we do it at, at, uh, at weaning. There are times when there's a group of cattle that, you know, we may grab them later than that. And some of them are a little earlier than that. Um, but I would say 90% of our samples are gathered at, at weaning time. So with the process, would you say it was fairly seamless for you? I mean, I know you said you're a data guy, so you like to look at that information, but when you 
get the results back? Is that easy? Was it easy to read, understand, kind of feel like anyone can kind of grasp it? Or did you have to, was there a learning curve with analyzing the data that came back? Yeah. I mean, there's always a learning curve with, with new technology and, uh, you know, we're, we're pretty data intensive. We have, uh, you know, we use uh, Ford Supply Technologies or CalCAF software and, and we've had our own prior to that, but we, every animal that we own had gets a, a high frequency tag from Ford Supply. We get that in the ear, we record it. We, it's tied back to the dam. So that calf's tied back to the dam. And then that cow data is, is, is uh, monitored, but gathering that and then getting the samples in, um, Neogen does a great job of turning those samples around. So you get the data back. Um, I would say that because I've been using the identity beef portion of that for our heifer selection, and we can talk about that later, but um, on the on the feeder side, um, I was familiar with the data already a little bit, but uh, where, where I think it comes into help and Tanner does a great job of breaking it, boiling it down and helping analyze that data in terms of this days on feed model. And um, so, you know, I think the biggest part of it was just trying to get buy-in from the staff from, you know, you're trying to do things at the speed of commerce. Um, it seems like every processing event is, it's a timed event, right? They want to see how many heads they can get done and how, how many hours. <laughs> So we designed our, our operational protocols around not slowing that process down. So they're getting an ear tag, we're scanning, we're getting the TSU, all in the same, in the same amount of time they're getting their vaccines and out the, and a weight recorded and out the, out the gate. So, um, you know, for us, we've got a, a pretty seamless operation. And I would, I would add that, uh, you know, even if it's a new process for the operation, we can make it seamless. We've got partners and, and other technology platforms as far as scanners and, and things like that to make it seamless. Um, like Rob said, anytime there's a process change, it's new and and, it, and it's going to take some some time to to get on the things and make it go. But um, the the idea between it is is for it to be a seamless transition. And then um, along with you know the large technical services team and, and sales team that Neogen has, um, you know there's there's people around to help make that seamless. As possible, anyway. Well, Rob, I, I like how you said uh, sometimes we try and do processing days as a timed event to see how many head we can get done in the shortest amount of time because everyone seems to be short on time these days. But yeah. um, so I guess question for both of you, and I'd like both your input on it. When you think about this technology from a big picture perspective, what do you think the greatest impact is going to be on the cow calf industry once this is more widely adopted. Anna, you want to start on that one? Yeah. So, so I, as we as we get through this, I think um, I think the impact to the cow calf industry. I mean, uh, the USDA report came out today for corn, right? And and uh, apparently, you know, the droughts been relieved somewhat in the Midwest. And so the corn is looking a little better and all of a sudden corn dropped and feeder cattle skyrocketed today. And, um, you know, as we, as we talk about the cost of these animals and the capital involved in feeding these animals, I mean, we're, we're talking $2,200 a, a feeder animal, $2,400 a feeder animal today. Um, that's a lot of capital compared to say three years ago. And so if we're going to feed them, we need to we need to be efficient in how we feed them. You know these margins are tight. They're um, it, we, we got to make sure what we're doing is matching matching the highest potential to, to get our money back. And so I think that's where the 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 biggest change is going to be. We'll go from um, using uh, traditional methods to to find some of these things to using you know objective data with stats and an analytical mindset to making these decisions on, on how to feed cattle. Um, the big, the big feeders already do it to an extent. Um, it's just a matter of, of what data you're using and what data you're collecting to, to make those decisions. And I think that's where it's going to come in. Um, precision is going to be part of the cattle industry, just like all other ag industries. And um, it just takes time to get there. Yeah, I would, uh, that's where I was going to go is, is on the economic side. Um, if, 
if you're able to predict, I mean, our, our corn went from, you know, 330 a few years ago to $9 last year. And so you look at the economics of that and it's not just corn, it's every other commodity, it's diesel, it's everything that you're dealing with, inflation. And so- Labor. Be, labor, for sure. And to be able to predict uh, those, I'd say less efficient cattle, I mean, that's a, to me, that's a game changer. Um, and so you're able to at least make, at least make a conscious decision on whether or not you want to feed those animals or, you know, put them back on the open market or what. So I, I think the economics part of it, um, and I think you'll soon, I think the producer will soon, soon learn that the cost of that analysis by far weighs itself um, and, and pays for itself in, in the longer term. I would even add to that, Rob, um, you know, it, it lends to uh, to help make some of those decisions. We got such a such a fascination with um, how many percent we can get to grade choice or higher, right? And and some of those cattle just won't do it. And we're putting corn into them for for uh, the hopes and dreams of getting there. And so, if we can tell on day one that this animal is not going to grade choice. It might pay to only feed them 150 days and, and take your lick and go on instead of uh, that extra 40 or 50 yeah. days of corn in. And so having that that mindset or that thought process is gonna gonna change the way we feed cattle at some point. Yeah, good point. So what do you think the biggest holdup is gonna be as far as this being adopted more? <clears throat> Awareness. I mean, awareness is part of it, right? As a, any new technology, uh, we got to learn about it first. And then, you know, even even Rob admitted uh, he was skeptical at first or, um, you know, data guy, he's got to see numbers, prove it to me kind of deal. And so um, data behind it's a big deal. Um, and, and seeing these things take place and unfold, um, I think that's going to be a large portion of of implementing it. And then, of course, you know, we've already touched on processes of making things seamless and easy, and, and that's it. That's another big driver in some of this. Um, but I look for I look for it, especially with the the cost of of doing business today for technology to start playing a bigger role in, in our cattle producing. Yeah, and I think too, Tanner, that uh, you know, cattlemen are pretty stubborn. They kind of have the way they like to do things, and you know, you're, you know, I, I know in my position and we have, you know, a pretty large outfit is that, you know, I'm bombarded by every pharmaceutical company, every, you know, everybody's trying to sell you the latest and greatest. And so you can really get caught up in, in chasing what I'd say, you know, chasing shiny objects, but, um, you know, convincing that showing and like, like Tanner saying, what, what, when I was able to see the results and going into the exact numbers that are in my grid, it was like, wow, okay. And so, um, and I think too, from a scale perspective, you know, the margins are so small in this business that you know, depending on whether you're able to, like, you know, I'm fortunate enough to be able to have a data person on my staff and and those things that really help, um, uh, and, you know, and, and a technology base, an IT department that can help me gather the data. And so, you know, when you get into a very small family outfit, it gets more and more difficult to, you know, start, you want to tag on another, you know, $2 for a TSU or whatever it is, and then the sample analysis time. And, and so, but I think that given what Tanner said and what I've seen that um, I think outfits like mine and others that can kind of set the example and show the value of what we're doing, I think you're going to see a lot more people get on board doing it or at least i hope so because as i go out and start buying feeders and, and buying calves you know i'm encouraging them to do this for me ahead of time and i'm willing to pay a little premium to, to get that information because i think it's worth it yeah i mean as far as that, that premium goes too, like uh the two indexes provided in the feeder test uh, from uh, the top 25 percent to the bottom 25 percent on our, our terminal index in today's value, it's over 280 bucks a head. Yeah. Um, and just in those two percentile groups, right? So um, hanging on the rail is, is a $280 a head advantage for the top 25%. 
it don't take very long to uh to go out and pay an extra 50 bucks or something to to capture the 280 right and so it's just a matter of uh, awareness and, and helping guys to to value those cattle and on the flip side of that i know rob is trying to buy feeder cattle but if you're selling feeder cattle and uh, you're not retaining ownership you don't know how those cattle grade or how those cattle perform you don't you don't have a leg to stand on when it comes to uh to bargaining um, price and, and having some leverage over quality of cattle, unless you're doing something like genomics to, to help prove out that value in those cattle. So. So which segment of the beef industry do you think is gonna push more for this technology? I mean, do you see feedlots pushing cow-calf producers to kind of start adopting it more? Or do you think cow-calf producers are gonna kind of jump onto this technology for themselves first, which segment do you kind of see pushing more for this? Interesting question. Um, I guess, of course, we're fairly well integrated, but, uh, you know, we're, everybody wants the best value for their calf. If you're just, you know, selling calves at weaning or whatever. And, and I, it's almost like a, I could see it pushing downstream and also upstream. And so, you know, going into a grid like we are at True SB for, or in, you know, any of the plants that we may sell to, you know, my knowing what I'm going in with means a lot right now. And before I, I kind of didn't know, right. If I'm buying feeders out of the sale barns, whatever, we spent a lot of time on our, on our heifer development, our genomics on, on that end. So I kind of, have a really good feel of where our raised cattle are, but I don't with our, a lot of our purchased cattle. And so um, I think we're going to see it kind of pushing both ways. And, and Tanner, I don't know, you're, you're more in the, in the midst of this uh, than I am because you're, because you're dealing with all every sector. Yeah, I think, I think we'll see it push from both sides a little bit too. Um, as we get further down the road, um, I think there's going to be some management use of this, right? How do we, how do we sort these cattle? How do we do, um, how do we, how do we make the most out of each day we have these cattle on feed, right? Basically, I want the highest revenue per day that I can get if I'm running a feed yard, and so I think there'll be some uses as far as uh, as sorting and, and doing some of that kind of stuff in a feed yard. Um, and I think I think we're starting to see that. There's some other programs that have, have been out and around a long time as far as sorting cattle and things like that in feed yards. Um, and and I'll use uh, use weight alone or weight as a big driving portion of it. And and weight's a good proxy of of genetic um, ability, right? Um, so higher gaining animals at the same day of age feed usually have a little better genetic potential, but we lack some some things we can't do with weight alone. Uh, we lack, you know, the ability for kind of predicting marbling and grade and, and fat cover thickness, things like that to to get through and truly value these cattle and, and try to determine how to feed them. And so I think there's some management opportunities for sure in a feed yard setting. And then as we, uh, like like Rob said, as we get into valuing these feeder cattle, there's, there's definitely an opportunity um, to, to scream, I have the best cattle, right? And I, and I can prove it. DNA is DNA and I can't change it. These cattle can do it. So Rob, you mentioned that you also use identity beef on your heifers, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do you see these two tests, in a sense, working together for you in the future if you're doing it on both ends? Yeah. Um, you know, we've, we've adopted... Uh, identity B five or six years ago. Um, I did the same thing. Okay. Prove it to me. You know, we took a little subsample here and then, um, realized that, um, for a commercial person like me, you know, I don't have EPDs on every one of my commercial cows or anything like that. And so this gave me a kind of an apples to apples platform where I could actually, um, look at the data and make better heifer selection, and, you know, before it was, okay, she looks really nice and she weighs this much, keep her. Um, and so when we first started uh, interpreting those, uh, in well, we've made our own indices, but the indices and then along with the 16 scores and really started to focus on it, um, 
I had a little pushback at first because, you know, half your guys have all been judging cattle or whatever most of their life. And you see this pretty little heifer and you color and they're like, what the heck are you doing? You know? And I'm like, no, score's not there, you know? And so uh, we have seen, I think, uh, a significant change in, in what our heifer selection looks like and our, and, and phenotypically what they look like, even though um, we're managing very much heavily by the score of it, um, it, it, it's, it's changed our selection process. Um, I even sample all of our purchase bulls, even though they have EPDs from say the Angus Association, Herford, whatever. Um, I still sample them so that I have the apples to apples comparison with my cow herd. And, um, we do that on every potential replacement heifer and every bull. And then I use, uh, like I say, we've done the pilot and now we're looking at implementing the feeder on all of our terminal animals. And so I see them going hand in hand. Um, you know, I don't need to collect uh, the more expensive uh, beef sample on terminal animals because really all I'm interested in is carcass merit and, and what's my best return on those animals. So, um, but we've seen a, I think a big change in, in our genetic profile uh, by implementing that system. I would also add that, uh, you know, by using identity beef on the female selection, um, you're increasing your overall merit or the overall genetic ability of your, your cow herd. Um, and turn around using that, that identity feeder on the steer or terminal animals, uh, it's giving you an opportunity to to manage what you have, right? Like as you as you make genetic improvement with your females, uh, things are going to get better over time. But uh, a genetic feeder will allow you to manage what you have at that point in time. You know, make those those decisions, and I think that's a a key difference between the two. Yeah. How long does it take to get results back off the feeder test from when you mail them in? So feeder test is about 17 days right now, um, time from the time the lab receives it. So, I mean, if it gets lost in the mail for two weeks, <laughs> that's a different deal. But from the time the, the lab receives it, it's 17 days, turnaround time. Um, and then from there, uh, depending on how far you want to go with analysis, um, you know, I can have it done in a couple of days to, you know, we'll we'll check back through this several times as, as cattle feeding changes or, or you know, uh, markets change we can we can rerun and, and reevaluate those situations so the dna process itself pretty set pretty seamless it's a simple tsu or a tissue punch and um, we tie it back to that animal id and it's sent off so pretty seamless process as far as that stuff goes and, and there's like i said there's other ways to even make it easier with scanners or or whatever other technology to to help, especially if you're collecting tens of thousands of these things. Yes, I will say the taking a TSU sample is really seamless. It doesn't take much time at all. That's what my family uses. I I like it. <laughs> yeah, boy, it it really made it a lot simpler, didn't it? And mm -hmm. getting blood or pulling hair, and it's just it, it that was a great invention. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't it doesn't take much extra time at all. It's really quick. I mean, so. But as we kind of wrap up today, is there anything else that either of you would like to say if you have any anything you'd like to encourage cow-calf producers to think about or um, anything else? Well, I would, I know there's a lot of optimism. There's some, you know, on my end, there's a lot of optimism. There's also a lot of skepticism out there in the industry about it. it's just another sample that people are trying to sell you, that kind of thing. I've I've seen the value in it. And so we've adopted it, you know, full full throttle. Um, but I can tell you that um and and I don't get paid by Neogen, so I can say this. Um the the team's been great to work with. They if you need help, they're there to help you. Um they have a great tech team that helps you interpret data if you're confused, anything like that. So um, that's really helped me adopt the situation because a lot of times you'll adopt a piece of software, whatever it is, and you just don't get that support and you get frustrated and you just give up. And I think uh, the team at Neogen has done a good job of making sure that, that uh, you get 
from a customer's perspective, what you need to get your job done. Yeah, I think I think I would I would add to to some of that too. I mean, we have we have a large team, great team, but uh, the thing I hope people take away from all these conversations is that um, DNA is DNA, and you can't change it. It's an objective data point that we can use to measure year in and year out. And um, if we start if we start using that data point. Um, whether we have weather changes or environmental changes, we still have that one point that doesn't change that we can measure off of to, to continue to make improvements and, and management decisions. And I think that's the key point that that uh, I would like people to, to take away from it is using objective data with the analytical mindset to make those decisions. Um, it's too easy, like Rob said, to go out and say, I like this effort or, you know, this this steer needs 180 days because he weighs 750 pounds and that's what we feed all 750 pound steers right and so when we can step away from that and, and start using some of these data points um and precision in in the cattle industry i think we can we can make strides um all the rest of our protein producers already do um they're leaps and bounds ahead of us and uh using precision technologies and they're their mating decisions, their breeding decisions, their environmental decisions. And um, it's it's time that we caught up with some of that. I'm not saying we should emulate everything they do because I believe they've made some mistakes along the way as well, but there's definitely some lessons learned in there. All right. Well, thank you to both of you for being on the show today. I really appreciate the conversation and I'll make sure that um, if you're a listener out there, be sure to go check the show notes and there'll be links where you can find more information about everything we talked about today. Thanks for having us. <laughs> Great. Shay, thank you for having us. Appreciate it. And that's a wrap on that one, folks. Thank you for tuning in today and joining in on the conversation. Be sure to take this a step further and take the advice you learned and implement it on your operation. If you want to have a conversation about it, head over to my social media and send me a DM by following at Cattle Convos and connecting with me there. Have a great day.